We have an extra Bible, so I gotta have some place to put it. Alright? How many of you brought your story with you today? Let me see it. Come on, hold on. Alright. Woo! Good job. There may be some of you, particularly if you're visiting with us, you have no idea what I'm talking about. The story, okay? And and, and this one looks a little different than all those that you have held up out there. Everything on the inside is the same as yours. Somebody bought me a nice Christmas gift, and it's a leather edition of what you have in a hard bag there. Uh, if you would like to join us for this journey over the next 31 weeks, you can go to Majesty Christian Bookstore out of Herndon and Cedar. They have them on sale right now for $14.95. We were able to get them for 7 bucks for a while. That has ended, uh, and we don't have any more here at that price, but they're normally $19.95. You can't get them at Majesty. You can go online and download them into your Kindle or your, your iPhone. And, uh, or your iPad, and you can also go online from Amazon or Christian Book Distributors and get them there. But uh, this is what we're going to be reading from. Again, if you're new, what is the story? This is, this is an abridged Bible, all right? Uh, it's set up in chronological order. It is set up like a book, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. There are not books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There are not chapters like chapter 1, verse 22. There are just chapters like in a book. Uh, this has all the key stories in it in chronological order. So that, have you ever had difficulty seeing the big picture of the Bible? Okay. The, this is designed to help us see the big picture in chronological order. At the beginning of the book, there's a map. We'll refer to that in the sermon today. Also, at the beginning of the book, there is a timeline. All right? If you're wanting to know the timeline of things, there's a timeline. And that timeline is also carried out uh, throughout the chapters. At the beginning of each chapter, you'll see that timeline taking place there. This will not have the duplications in it, where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all may tell the same story. It will only tell it once in here. So, this is the way it's designed. For the next 31 weeks, we're going to take this panoramic view of the story so we can get the big picture of God's vision for history. His story. That's why we're reading the story. And to see how we fit into that. We are also uh, providing some various things. Uh, because this is a church-wide event. We are doing this in our Sunday school classes with our children. Uh, we have an adult Sunday school class which is doing this. We have um, our high school group is doing it. So throughout the church. So when you pick your kids up from Sunday school today. You can ask them what did they learn. And hopefully it should be something that you learned in here. And what we're doing with the kids uh, in our Sunday school program is the kids are going to be getting uh, playing cards. Training cards. Oh, yeah, playing cards are ace, king, queen. That's right. That's my Baptist perspective coming out. They're going to get training cards each week. Parents, you will get one like this today from your kids, correct? Uh, and this tells you on the back kind of what's happening for the next 31 weeks. Uh, parents, use these cards to quiz your children on memory verses and Bible story summaries. And on the back of the cards they get each week, and this is the one they'll get today, the primary character of the day story is God. And on the back, there is a memory verse, all right? So you can quiz them with that and have questions. And then you can also play games with them, all right? Shuffle up the cards as they get more than one each week. And hopefully they'll want to collect all 31, and they get to collect all 31 by being here the next 31 Sundays in a row, okay? So those are our, our training cards that your kids will be getting in Sunday school in our pre-K through 6th grade. All right. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? I'm forgetting something. That's all right. We'll figure it out. All right. This would be a great time now for you to get a pen or a pencil. Uh, get your journal out if you went and purchased a journal this week or your notebook so you can keep notes if you would like. We recommended a journal or a notebook so as you read, how many of you, here's what I forgot, how many of you got your poke through an email this week? Still in the Facebook term. Okay, how many of you did not get an email from the church this week? Raise your hand. Okay, that means because one, you don't have an email. <laughs> Number two, we do not have your correct email address. So what we're going to do is every Tuesday after our staff meeting, Teresa is going to send out churchwide to everybody we have an email address for, just a short email, all right? All it's going to say is, read chapter 2 this week, that's pages 13 through 27. That's it, all right? How many of you read 
said, chapter 1, before you got here today, would you look at that? I was told maybe 50% might do it. This is about 75% of you raised your hand. That is phenomenal. Uh, in the 8 o'clock service, when I said I was surprised with them, I expected it to be lower. They said, that's the other services. <laughs> so they ragged on you this morning at 8 o'clock. But, but anyway, oh, thank you so much for doing that. And that's what we want to do each week is read the chapter in the book, the storybook, before we preach on it that Sunday. All right? So thank you for doing that. Get that pen. Get that pencil out so you can take notes. You can take notes in your journal as you read during the week. You can take notes today during the sermon. And if there are questions that you have that don't get answered, write them down. And today or tomorrow, send an email to me, Tim at newhopechurch.net. All right? It's on the back of the bulletin if you forget it, but Tim at newhopechurch.net. Write your questions down that didn't get answers, you'd like to have an answer to, and we'll do our very best on Wednesday night to answer those questions. All right? So what we'll do is, with all the questions that come in, we'll see, okay, I'm going to guess that many of you will have the same question. So we will make sure on Wednesday night that we answer the most frequently asked questions. At least we'll attempt to find those answers together. And then we'll also try to save some time every Wednesday night to answer other questions that may have come up since then. But if you get those to me by Monday evening and Tuesday morning, we can assemble those questions for Wednesday night. So send them to Tim at newhopechurch.net. All right, have you got that pen? Uh, if you don't have one, borrow one. Don't steal one. Because we're going to be talking about the story in a few weeks. Thou shalt not steal, okay? So don't go there. Um, if you don't have a journal, in your bulletin, on the back flat, there is a place for some minimal notes, okay? So you can write some things down which are there. Let's just quickly, just for the fun of it, how many of you were here last week and played Deal or No Deal with us? Raise your hand. Oh, good job. What was the first deal we offered you last week? Do you remember? To read. To read. Personal reading. And that is that you would read the story one chapter every week for the next 31 weeks. And many of you already said you did that. Great job. You were off to a phenomenal start. Thank you very much. What was the second deal that we offered to you last week? Family time. You would sit down with members of your family, your spouse, your kids, and read it together. How many of you found some family time and did that this week? Raise your hand. Not as good as the personal reading, but that's pretty good. That's better than the 8 o'clock service. Okay, you get you actually far more of you in here did that. Show that I got it in last night about 8 o'clock. Okay? <laughs> but we, we, we got it in, all right? We got it in after we went to the movie and saw Joyce and Boys. Couple of little dicey scenes in it, but overall, really good movie. You walk out of there feeling really good. And, uh, I'm waiting to see Fawn break out and up here, all right? The worst uh, over the next few weeks and some things, some moves she learned from that movie, all right? Family time. The third deal was? Small groups, yeah. Whether it's coming on Wednesday night and joining us over in the other building, uh, or whether it's just three or four of you getting together uh, every week or every other week and just kind of encouraging and holding each other accountable as you read and ask your questions and uh, just sort of to get the best out of it, we want to use every avenue possible. The fourth deal was what? Worship. And how many of you made it today? <laughs> That's one all of you can raise your hand on today. Great start. Thank you. If you're new to New Hope, you know we don't hammer much on, on, on attendance. We love it. We like it when you're here. It, it makes it really enjoyable when you're present. But, but we're not here monitoring your attendance every Sunday. Let me say this as a footnote. I've already had about eight people last Sunday and this Sunday come up to me to tell me what Sundays they're going to be missing the next 31 weeks. <laughs> you do not need to tell me what you're going to miss, okay? I, there, there are no bonus points for telling me, okay? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not videoing you to see who's here and who's not. This was just <laughs> encouraged, but that if you want to get this big picture, we, we don't want to leave any sections out. And so be here if at all possible. Don't let this be a third or fourth priority. Don't let just a last minute thing take you away, all right? Make sure this is something that, you know, is, is really big and you need to be away. And if you have to be gone, then it will be available to you on our website via audio. You can download it, listen to it audibly, or uh, we found out it does work. It is being videoed right now. That's what Robert is doing, sitting right there in the middle. 
Uh, look at, that's an iPhone that's videoing this. Hi guys, good to see y'all. Thank you very much. So you can also video, video it. As I told you last week, I have a great face for audio. Do you accept the written excuse from the doctor? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then the last deal that we made to you last week was share the story. That's right. Find someone, friends, members, neighbors, friends. Give a copy of the story to it. Say, hey, if, if, if you have any time, why don't you come join us on Sundays? We're going to do it. Have you ever had questions about how the Bible fits together? Over the next 31 weeks, we're going to do that. You know what? If you can't come to church, how about you and I once a month or once every two weeks get together and talk about what we have been reading in the chapter in the book called The Story. All right? And just how many of you shared the story this week? Just raise your hand. You shared this week. Oh, good. Good. Outstanding. Terrific. All right. Well, let's get started. Let me make this confession at the outset. At 7 a.m. this morning, I was terrified. In fact, I shot a text to Shelly. You better pray. I'm not sure how this is going to work today. I, I, I'm, following the, this, I'm following a script to a certain point. You have to get each of these done each week. As most of you know, I'm not overly time conscious. Uh, I often do an amplified version, okay? Uh, I don't like leaving things out. I like to make sure all the bases are covered. Man, just... Just a struggle fitting into somebody else's time schedule. Also, I'm used to preaching out of this and the switch to this. This is a challenge. So I have both of them up here, and I'll try to refer to them as much as I can. And I'll be saying page number and reference number, and sometimes that gets cumbersome. So if I screw up, please be gracious with me the first week or two. It will take some, some adaptation to get there. But uh, if you would, turn to page one of chapter one in the story. And that is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in a regular Bible. All right? So chapter 1, uh, paragraph 1 in the story, Genesis 1, verse 1, in your regular Bible. While you're turning there, I have a question for you. What, do, what does the Dark Knight, Citizen Kane, The Matrix, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and Jaws all have in common? I'm, I'm hearing lots of noise. <laughs> Some of you say, man, I, I have no idea. Right? Suspense, yeah, most of them are suspense movies, no question. But here's what they all have in common. If you were, if you were to Google the question, what are the great opening scenes of movies? Those five show up in every top 25 list that I look at that have been assembled over the last seven or eight years. They all have great, unforgettable <laughs> opening scenes. And if you miss the opening scene, the rest of the movie just wouldn't have made as much sense. The beginning of our journey this morning, through the story, which is God's story of the Bible, is like the beginning of an action-packed movie. If you miss the opening minutes of the movie with its fast-paced scenes, you will not understand appropriately the rest of the film. It is the same with the Bible's grand story. You see, this story opens with a big bang. <laughs> One of you got that. I don't mean the big bang of evolution. This is not an accident, folks. This is the big bang of the revelation of God. God is the main character of this grand story. <clears throat> Chapter 1, first sentence. Would you read with me, out of your copy of the story, the first four words. In the beginning, God. I only said the first four words. In the beginning, God. Right off the bat, it introduces the main character of this story. God. This big bang of creation is not an impersonal accident, but this is the creative purpose of a personal God. Read with me the rest of that sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In ten words, look what's happened. The heavens are in place and the earth has been completed in ten words. Clancy, steel, Lakato, eat your heart out 
with that creative penmanship. God said in ten words more than they could say in ten chapters. The big bang of creation is presented poetically, artistically. We often think of, of manufacturing, of building something as dirty, nasty work. We often think of a, 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 a man with a tool belt. He's on his knees bending over. Okay. <laughs> Man, not in creation. Not in creation. This is poetic and artistic. The Trinity engineering firm are the ones who organize the blueprints for this creation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the partnership of that business. And they put together the blueprints for this massive science project. The sequence and the pattern of Creation is simple, but in some ways it's too overwhelming to take it in. The sequence of creation is divided into two parts. This is where I wish I had two big pieces of paper up here. So just play with me here, all right? And you got two big pieces of paper. We're going to look at part one of creation and part two of creation, all right? Part one is the first three days, the first half of creation. Day one, day two, and day three are the places that are created by the Lord. And then day four, which would match up with day one, and day five, which matches up with day two, and day six, which matches up with day three. There's symmetry to this, all right? These are the filling of the places with the things and the objects, all right? So let's look at it like this. Day one on this list, light. And day. If you turn to the story, chapter 1, page 1, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. There was light before there was sun, moon, and stars. And there was darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And that was evening and morning. <coughs> that was the first day. So, light and dark. Day 2, sky, air up above, water. Down below, places. Day three, land. Okay, the continents, land. Now, let's go to the second half of creation, all right? So day four over here, remember it's going to match up with day one on that list, okay? They're going to pair up. Day one, day four go together. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Light, sun, dark, moon, and stars. In the evening, so we have the things that go in the places. Day five, Sky and water, that was day two, matches up with day five. Birds that fly in the air in the sky, and all the sea creatures, the things that swim in the waters. And then day six matches up with day three. Three land, the animals that roam the land. Isn't that beautiful? The artistry and the poetry behind all that. It's just gorgeous, and yet it also is incomprehensible. And what did God say after each one of these? <laughs> this is good. <laughs> but on the last part of the last day, God saved his best work for last. He created Adam. The pride and joy of his creative work came last. You see, the big bang of creation concludes with God's core passion. Human beings, we are the apple of his eye. You see, God's core passion is people who are made in his image. Chapter 1, page 2. I'll get there. Then God said, bottom of page 2. Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and the wild animals and all the creatures that move on the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them and later on, God said about that final act of creation, this is very good. This is real. All the beauties of creation, the sky, 
and the sea, the mountains and the valleys. All of God's beautiful acts of creation are secondary to you and to me. This truth is an incredible esteem builder. I would recommend to you every morning, read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and understand when God looks at you, he said, very good. He wants you more than the mountains and the valleys. He wants you more than the lakes and the ocean. He wants a relationship with you more than the lions and the tigers and the giraffes and the whales. I'll be honest, sometimes I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, and I don't say this is good, <laughs> and I surely don't say this is very good. <laughs> I often look and say, this is not so good. When God looks at you and me, God says looking at you is better than an ocean view. God says looking at you is better than watching beautiful animals dart across the Serengeti. He says looking at you is better than watching a sunset. Do you need a boost of self-esteem today? Then why don't you drink in some of God's esteem from Genesis 1, 2. God's supreme passion is to be with you and me at all costs. Now men... Before you let your head get too big. Now, now guys, please know, men, we were created first. Okay? Just know that. Alright? But as I was reading from Shelley's version of the story last night, <laughs> verse 26 of Genesis 1, in hers, it says that God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And God pulled out his brains and made the woman. <laughs> a rather serendipitous version of the Bible, all right? It uh, really doesn't say that. In fact, if you, if you turn in here, you will find that in the story it says that God called deep sleep to fall over Adam. It's, good, it's not good for him to be alone. And he took a rib. Have you ever wondered why a rib? I can't answer it with all certainty for you today because the story doesn't give me the answer with full certainty. But I certainly think there's a reasonable possibility. You see, the rib is that bone that is closest to our heart. I had to find my heart. It's the bone that is closest to our heart. So when he said it's not good for man to live alone, he, he wanted that partner spouse to be closest to our I like that. In page three of the story, God plants Adam and Eve in a place called the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Everybody's heard of the Garden of Eden. It's the other term that's used to talk about utopias. It's the phrase used to talk about a place of perfection and great delight. And the original Garden of Eden was a place of perfection and delight. It's, uh, it's believed by scholars to be found between the lower branches of the Tigris and Euphrates River. I don't know if you all have discovered that in your story, the opening flight, there is a map. So I want you to turn to the map, if you would, please. It weeks to come, and when I get better at getting this done well in advance, and Milo's around, Milo's gone today, and my techie guy, uh, we'll throw some maps up for you from time to time so you can get the visual, but you have it in your book called The Story. So if you will find the Persian Gulf, that's the lower right-hand corner, all right, of that, you'll see the Persian Gulf. You'll, you'll come up just a little ways, and you'll see the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And then you'll see a little dot that says Ur. That's the name of the city we'll get to eventually. Well, just below Ur is where folks believe that the Garden of Eden probably was found originally. So if you want to take, this is okay to do, get your pen out, your pencil, and why don't you draw just a beautiful tree right there at the fork of the rivers, okay? And, and, and this is going to be a note, and this is where the Garden of Eden was. This is kind of like bringing Sunday school to big church, okay? You get to draw. So just draw, draw two trees if you like, okay, for the garden. If you want to hang an apple on one of them, you can get as creative as you would like to right here, but just, just, just 
put right here so that you know that's, that's the place of where all this probably happened. And we'll get to this a little more later. And again, it's not about certainty, but some of you are going to say what happened in the Garden of Eden. There was a flood. Okay, now let's move on. When you think, now, do you guys know in modern day where that location you just drew on your map is? That's modern day Iraq, just in case you wanted to know. All right, modern day Iraq. All right. The Garden of Eden, beautiful place. What do you think of when you think about the most beautiful places you could ever be? What, what just jumps into your mind? See, Eden, Eden, never been there? Okay, good, all right. Take me the next time you're going, all right. Columbus. Yosemite, okay, Yellowstone. Clovis? Okay, you all know I am a real Clovis fan. Okay, I am, I, I am, I am, I am, I am, you know, I, I breed and bleed Clovis, okay? Uh, I'm not sure I would say it's the most beautiful place on earth, okay? Uh, space Cap. Any, any of you Space Cap? Any of you play golf? How about Pebble Beach? Okay. Uh, any of you go hiking, Yellowstone, Yosemite, uh, you know, Montana, great, great, but just uh, none of those even hold a candle to the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible tells the story of the big bang of creation, and everything was good, very good. Remember, this is the opening scene, a lot happens in the opening scene, and this Bible story continues with the big bang of the fall, and something goes terribly wrong with this beautiful creation. You see, Adam and Eve are created with the freedom and the power of choice. God does not force love. Back, okay, page four. Okay, page four. Uh, okay, bottom of page three. <laughs> the big one. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees. You can eat of everything in the garden. Right in the middle, there's two trees. You need to choose. Am I going to eat from the tree of life? Am I going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You see, the scripture tells us later on on page 4 that God came nightly to walk in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. Do any of you do evening walks? Do you walk with your spouse or with your kids or with a neighbor? And, and most, yeah, most of the time you do it in the evening. And, and, and why do we do it in the evening? It's cooler, yeah, unless it's cold already. But it's cooler. But, but, but we relax. It's unwinding from the adventure of the day. It's a chance to get caught up. It's a chance to enjoy fellowship. It's a chance to unwind. And then, see, God had given Adam and Eve the responsibility of naming the animals and the plants and overseeing, tending to the garden. And he would come at the cool of the day. And I think that's cool. God came at the cool of the day and he walked and he fellowship with Adam and Eve. That was his daily desire and his daily routine. You see, this is not some faraway God who is uninterested in his creation. He comes down here to walk with Adam and Eve. God's simple vision was to walk, to hang out with Adam and Eve. This is the big idea of the whole story. God's supreme passion. The point of the story from the beginning to the end is God with us. That's what he wants. He wants to come down here and be with us. He is not some angry God way off up there just looking for the chance to zap us. You ever think that about God? He makes every effort to be with us. And he wants us to choose to be with him. He makes every effort. That's the point of the story. There's not a chance that he's lost the desire to be with us. But something in that first, first scene of the story went terribly wrong. God does not force us to have a relationship with him. 
This relationship is based on love and trust. He does not hold a lightning bolt to our head and say, love me or else. He gives us a choice. And that's where the story introduces the tale of two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 9 and 17. It's found on pages 3 and 4 in the story. Are you guys kind of get the picture of why it's important to have read this before you come? Yeah. Okay? Because if I have to read all this again, you won't get out of here on time. Adam and Eve, on one occasion, rebelled against God. The serpent. That's the disguise that the devil used to appear to Eve and to Adam. And he taunted them with eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in essence, what he said to them, if you will eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be self-sufficient. If, if, if the temptation with this, you will be like God. If you'll be like God, you don't need God, so you will be sufficient. You can handle everything yourself. You don't need anybody else. That's the essence, what real sin is. It's independence from God. God wanted to choose dependence. Eat of the tree that I chose, and I'll give you life. Eat of the tree, I say ignore, and you will die. Wow. You see, God's vision to be with his people, the ones made in his image, was ruined at the very beginning of the story. And the whole rest of his story is about God's pursuit to get us back. God's passion, God's purpose, the big idea of the story is God wants to be with us. And he designed a way in which it could happen, and we screwed it up in the very first scene. And so all the rest of the scenes are about him getting us back. The Bible in this opening scene also reports the big bang of sin's damage to the human race. Because Adam and Eve chose a different vision than God's vision, sin became a part of their spiritual DNA. And Adam and Eve produced more sinners. We don't know how fast exactly that the fall occurred after Adam and Eve's creation, but we know it had to be pretty quick. And here's why we know that. Because God's first directive to Adam when he woke up from the deep sleep and out of his rib, God had fashioned a woman. The first direction God gave to man was, go for it. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. I don't, I don't think Adam waited long to start the process. I'm just guessing. Okay? But they hadn't had any kids yet before the fall. I would even suggest they had not even conceived yet before the fall. And the reason for that is because their first two children show up on the scene after they had been exported, expelled out of the Garden of Eden. God said, you can never enter here again. And he put angels in front of the entrance to prevent their sneaking back in and eating from the tree of life. And it's then that they gave birth to Cain and to Abel. And they could not pass on down to their children what they did not possess. You see, Adam and Jesus Christ are the only two men who ever walk on the face of this earth in absolute perfection. Adam didn't last very long. I suggest he didn't even make it 33 years. <laughs> okay? He did not last very long in perfection. Jesus completed his life in perfection. It's why in the book of Romans, Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the second Adam, finishing what the first Adam failed to accomplish. And men, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the story of Jesus later in this story, though all of our wives that we're married to have a sin nature, you are not, sorry ladies, none of your husbands married a perfect woman. But men, just so you don't gloat too much about that, please know that your children have a sin nature. Not because of their mother, but because of their father. 
So when your wife says to you, your children are behaving just like you, she's right. You say, Tim, this is one of those kind of deep theological principles here, but here's how we know this. Jesus had an earthly mother, but he did not have a sin nature. So what was the one difference between Jesus' birth and our birth? His father. He had a heavenly father, not an earthly father. So just as the, the sex of your children is determined by you, Daddy, the sin nature transmitted from one generation to the next is transmitted through you, Dad. Now, wives, just, just to keep you toned down a bit today, when you go home, <laughs> remember, all of you had an earthly father. So that means you have a sin nature as well. In Genesis chapter 4 through 9, they present sin and sin nature permeating the human race in those first 1,800 to 2,000 years and the destruction that that sin nature brought to this world. You see, God created the world with this grand vision of dwelling together with us in the garden. It is God's supreme passion to be with every one of us. God gave us the freedom of choice, just as he did Adam and Eve. And they chose, out of the freedom of their will, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thus ruining God's vision of dwelling together with us. Sin was deposited permanently into the nature of Adam and Eve. And this was a deadly virus separating them from a holy God. And it is the root of all evil and sickness and hatred and death. And that is the reason, folks, there is cancer in the world today. It's more than likely not because you committed some great sin in your life and God is throwing down a lightning bolt of the C word on you. We live in a world dominated and influenced by sin and it happens to all of us. Because this environment is not the environment God intended. He's bringing us that environment one day. It's called the second coming. It's called the new heaven and the new earth. But between now and the redemptive process and the transformation of our lives, between now and then, you and I will experience the just and the unjust, these consequences of sin. God banished Adam and Eve from the garden and sent the angel to the garden in order to keep them from the tree of life, which would stay, sustain them forever. Have you ever thought that God was mean because he blew them out of the garden? Have you ever thought that God must be mean because he put angels with blazing swords in front of the entrance to keep them out? I hope you know better. But if you don't, I hope you will when you leave here today. You see, if they had continued to eat from the tree of life, in their sin-polluted condition. They would have lived forever in that sin-polluted condition. Would that have been grace? Would you like to live in your own humanity in the condition that you were in now? Would you like this condition to be what you have to look forward to for all eternity? I suggest most of us probably wouldn't. It's an act of God's grace to keep us from being able to sustain our life in this potential and real life of sin and hatred. Man's choice resulted in separation from God and it broke God's heart. And the rest of the story, the entire Bible, tells us of the relentless pursuit of God and the extent to which he will go in order to bring us back, to restore his vision and his purpose. Page 7 in the story tells us of Cain and Abel, that offspring, that tainted offspring of Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, Cain and Abel. Who was the oldest? Cain, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you think it would have been Abel because A is first in the alphabet. That's our English alphabet. No, I don't know if that's true with that. But, but Cain is the oldest. Abel. What was the big problem between Cain and Abel? Jealousy. Jealousy over what? But, but favoritism over what? God. God. Look how damaging religion is. <laughs> the practice of religion was what created this act of jealousy and anger in Cain's life, and he killed his brother. 
The first murder takes place in the very first generation of offspring from Adam and Eve. Man is sin destructive in a hurry. And every one of us have received that nature. It has been transferred to every generation since. It causes us to want to try to take care of ourselves. From Cain and Abel, evil and its influence have continued to expand. In fact, let me show you how in about 1,800 years it expanded. Turn to page 8. Okay, page 8. From Cain and Abel to the time of Noah. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Whew. Try to imagine. Let me put this in a simple illustration if I can. Let's say you were the parents with four children. Just, just four kids. Six, eight, ten, twelve. Good ages? A little break in between? Six, eight, ten, twelve. Think of what your house would be like if from the time those kids woke up in the morning until they went to bed at night, all four of those kids, their thoughts and their actions were evil from morning till evening. What would your house be like? Now multiply that by hundreds of thousands. And that's the world at the time of Noah. The scripture says they were wicked. Their only thoughts were of evil. That is how rapidly wickedness had grown since the fall of Adam and Eve. And then the next, the next verse after that, the next line after that on page 8, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the apple of his eye was now a regret. If the story ended right there, it would be a sad story. If the story ended right there, it would be devastating for all of us. But I want you to know, God is not going to give up on us. He regrets the condition that we were in at that point, but he said, I'm not giving up. And God says, I'm going to come up with a plan to give a fresh start, a new beginning. Don't we all like a mulligan? God's going to take a mulligan right here. All right? God looks for the best guy around. There's only one good guy left. His name is Noah. If you read it, you know, there's only one who was righteous, only one who found favor. His name is Noah. And he says, Noah, build an ark. What's an ark, God? It's a boat. What's a boat, God? And it's going to help keep you afloat when the rains come. What's rain, God? It never rained up to that time. Everything was misted from the ground up like dew. I'd like to go around the neighborhood and tell her about what your daddy does. He builds a boat. <laughs> a boat? Rain? Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and the animals. They get on the boat. So God can get the world to do over. God says, I'm going to wipe out all of this wickedness. Now, in your, in your, in your Bible, turn, go, go back to the map. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Then they floated around for about another 150 days. And then the waters began to recede a bit. And then, then the bottom of the ark bumped up against the top of Mount Ararat, and it stuck there until the waters receded, until God opened the, 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 the door of the ark, and Adam and his family and the animals could go back out on dry ground. Now, if you want to go right up that Tigris Euphrates Valley, go right up towards the top, you see where it says Assyria, just beyond where it says Assyria, somewhere in that region are the mountains of Ararat. Okay? So if you want to draw a little ark right about there, just make a little boat. Okay? Well, put a little boat. Have some fun with it, all right? Uh, draw a couple of lions if you want to, all right? Or whatever. But draw a dove and a crow. Okay? A raven. Whatever. It's Noah's Mark. And that's, that's about where it was. When God opened the door, Noah and his family went out. Noah offered a sacrifice. 
to God for saving them. The scripture says the sacrifice was like a sweet fragrance to God. God deeply appreciated the gratitude. If you're going to get a start over, isn't it great to get a start over with grateful folks? It, it reflected Noah was dependent upon God. And he offered sacrifice. And God said, Noah, because, because of, of your attitude, I'm going to make a promise to you. I am never going to destroy the entire world again with a flood. And I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky to remind you of this covenant. Every time you see a rainbow, that is a reminder that I've made a promise. I will never wipe the world out again by great waters, by a flood. <coughs> wow. That's beautiful. But then, you don't find it in here. But you find not long after that, Noah consumed a little too much of the fruit of the vine. In Genesis chapter 9, it tells us that Noah ended up drunk. And he was in his tent, naked. The Bible doesn't give us great detail, but it tells us that some untoward things happened. One of the sons walked in and brought shame on his father's nakedness, and the other two sons walked in backwards so they could not see it, and they covered him up. Noah, shortly after the fresh start, discovered he was naked. He was in a vulnerable place. The scripture says, the evening after the incident of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it said when Jesus came in the cool of the evening, he called out, Adam, where are you? Adam said, here I am. We were hiding because we were afraid. We were, why are you afraid? Because we are naked. Not any more naked than he had been before he ate the tree from the tree of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but now, because he was self-sufficient rather than God-sufficient,